Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Shuaish. I'm a second year ID fellow, and I will be presenting today on the impact of infectious diseases on the economy. So I'll start off with an interview uh, given by Dr. Hans Kludge, who is the director of the WHO's European region to the uh, UK Telegraph earlier this month. We always thought that health was the driver of economic prosperity, but it's worse. Where there is no health, there's no economy. This is a lesson that cannot be forgotten. Public health deserves its place at the top of the agenda. And sometimes when a leader has suffered personally, it helps. And of course, this is in relation to what's going on right now with uh, COVID-19. So a little background, health is core to a thriving productive society. Whereas in contrast, illness can stifle production, consumption, recreation, travel, and overall well-being. Infectious diseases not only have an impact on, um, not only have impact on the health sector and global health impacts, but they pose a, uh, a bigger issues and a wider range of socioeconomic disruptions. The positive association between health and wealth calls for greater investment in health systems and services. And this is the argument that sectors outside of health need to engage and to contribute in multi-sectoral uh, solutions to reduce and manage risk disease. So, Global life expectancy has increased by 24 years since, the since 1950, according to this article. And life expectancy is projected to exceed 85 in several countries in the second half of the century. Um, these advances are due to actually declines in infectious disease mortalities related to improved sanitation, hygiene, clean water, nutrition, vaccination, um, and antibiotics, medical practices in health systems, and income growth. So what are the factors that weaken the economy? So obviously missing work and becoming less effective at jobs reduces productivity. Social distancing, like what's going on now with COVID-19, closed schools, enterprises, commercial establishments, transportation. Um, also infectious diseases tend to uh, have a toll on governments and stability of governments, weakening military capabilities of some countries and international peacekeeping efforts. Um, infectious diseases can also cause political destabilization, which will in turn also impact economy. Um, and this I thought was interesting. A study showed that TB prevalence correlates strongly with political instability, even in countries who achieved a measure of democracy. Also, um, infectious diseases can um, sprout civil conflicts, which will in turn impact um, negotiations between you know, people. It can cause a lot of instability, which will, which will cause um, uh, potentially uh, impacts on economy. Uh, trade and embargoes and restriction to travel will lead to more friction uh, between different countries. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is just a uh, table that um, looks at the uh, trade disruptions across different um, um, in different periods of previous uh, infections and outbreaks, um, and you can just read through it. The avian influenza in 1997, 1997 caused uh, losses for poultry production, uh, commerce, and tourism, um, causing a financial loss of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, the uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, CJD, in 1995 caused mass slaughter of cattle, markedly reducing beef consumption and a, um, a uh, European embargo against British beef, causing loss of 5.75 billion, including 2 billion in lost beef exports. And the list goes on. Plague in India in 1994 caused um, a financial loss of $2 billion. So these are very significant numbers. Now, the distribution of the effect of infectious diseases on the economy is not equally distributed among different sectors. For example, there is benefit to some pharmaceutical companies or other products or services needed, for example, during the time of an outbreak. Health and life insurance companies have a heavy burden. Livestock producers will um, suffer with outbreaks linked to animals. Also, um, on different populations, it differs. For example, the poor population is generally more vulnerable because they have less access to healthcare. So this is just like just this is just an example of what's what's going on right now with uh, COVID-19 and how there is benefit to some companies. Uh, Clorox, for example, their sales jumped to 32 percent. Peloton, which is a uh, company that produces bikes, also their sales jumped because obviously people can't go to uh, gyms. 
the company that produces masks, 3M, also uh, in the first quarter, uh, their revenue grew 3% to $8.08 billion. Publix also, their, their sales jumped to 10%, um, uh, causing a, a growth of $1 billion. And Zoom, which is like Teams, it's a video conference, everybody, it has gained a lot of popularity uh, during this time also. And um, the stocks went up to 120% this year. So the World Bank estimates the economic losses from six major outbreaks of highly fatal zoonoses between 1997 to 2009 to be at least $80 billion. If prevented, this would have saved $6.7 billion a year. So again, a very significant number. So who is involved in um, sort of um, uh, assessing the impact of infectious diseases uh, and outbreaks um, that can happen on the economy and therefore um, allowing and persuading policymakers uh, to invest in public health. So the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, which is set up by the WHO and the World Bank in 2018, it monitors um, response readiness for pandemics and other health emergencies. The second panel on cost effective effectiveness in health and medicine, it also evaluates the impact of infectious diseases outside of the health sector. Uh, the WHO also gave out an economic impact guide that I'll talk about a little later. Um, the animal health sector is also very uh, uh, involved because of how, you know, how significant um, uh, it can be affected in outbreaks related to animals and the CDC as well. So the global health security agenda um, is created by the CDC in an effort to stop outbreaks and protect the health of people worldwide, which will in turn protect the demand for U.S. exports and the jobs they support. It is a collaboration and partnership between different sectors and organizations to ensure the world is ready to prevent a public health emergency. With the global health security agenda, countries have the opportunity to consider the focus of their investments. This is a list um, by the WHO, which is updated every so often, of uh, diseases with um, epidemic and pandemic potential that calls for urgent uh, research and development, and it prioritizes these uh, diseases. Um, number one right now, obviously, it is COVID-19, and if you see at the bottom, there's disease X, and this is basically something in the future that could potentially lead to an outbreak. So disease factors that impact the economy, what are the factors in the course of a disease of the infection um, that will ultimately impact the economy? So disease um, in the phase of the disease preparedness and prevention, factors that mitigate risk, um, all those factors will ultimately lead to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, they will impact the economy. The event itself, business uh, continuity, supply chain disruption, trade and travel bans, public contagion avoidance behavior, and the event aftermath um, associated with long-term employment loss, permanently closed markets or farms, long-term stigmas associated with specific animal products, impacts of childhood loss, education, and being orphaned, all of which will um, cause for you know, less, uh, uh, lower uh, productivity, ultimately impacting uh, the economy. So who is affected? So the health sector obviously is very much affected. So the effect of the um, infections on the health sector is usually not straightforward, is usually straightforward, but not always, as in the case of a pandemic where it can be unpredicted. Cost estimates are linked to short-term medical spending, health burden, and mortality. It varies by country, and it may not include indirect costs. So indirect costs like costs related to um, transportation to certain to health facilities or childcare support or the psychological toll that it can have on families, for example, and the services that they require. So these are called indirect uh, costs, which may not be included in the um, in the measurement of the uh, impact of infections on this particular sector. Um, so just uh, as an example, uh, Zika. Um, in, 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 for infants can cause microcephaly um, that will cause up to 10 million, that can cause up to $10 million a lifetime. Uh, Gillian uh, uh, um, uh, Barr syndrome, which is a rare complication, can cause up to $500,000 uh, per year of direct uh, medical cost. The Ebola crisis in West Africa um, between 2013 
and 2015 uh, caused a significant toll on the health uh, sector because it caused infections among health healthcare workers that caused up to 23 23% decline in workforce. So there was a great deficiency of the of healthcare services, which caused an additional 10,600 deaths due to diseases outside of Zika impacting the health sector. <clears throat> Childhood deaths also increased from vaccine preventable uh, diseases at the time because of that re for that reason. Um, the effect on agriculture and food and an the animal sector. Um, obviously, this is affected from um, uh, zoonotic outbreaks. So 50% of reported livestock losses are due to zoonosis. Zoonosis is a higher percentage of um, leading to animal slaughter as part of the disposal of the animal than non-zoonotic events, 43% versus 6%. So there's a lot of loss. In the United States, net meat exports near 12% of production, and therefore investment in animal health is a priority. So depending on how um, how much a specific sector contributes to the uh, economy, any um, uh, the impact of the infection on that specific specific sector will have a significant effect on the economy. Um, and I'll talk about that later as well. So, uh, for example, after a ban of meat imports from Somalia and Arabian countries due to valley fever in 2000, Somalian livestock market collapsed. Collapsed. 90% uh, of Somalia's total income as a country was from livestock exports. And therefore, this caused a greater than 75% loss in exports and a loss of $300 million. And this um, caused a decline in Somalia's GDP, which is the gross domestic product, which is a measure of a country's uh, economy, to go down to 25 to 36 percent, causing instability in the government. Also, as an example, H1N1 uh, in Mexico, um, the exports of fresh pork declined, resulting in a country's pork trade, a country, the country's pork trade deficit of 27 million dollars by the end of 2009. Tourism and travel, uh, for example, in 2003 with the SARS outbreak, uh, tourist arrival in Hong Kong dropped 68%. Uh, Asia Pacific carriers lost $6 billion in revenue. North American Airlines lost $1 billion. H1N1 influenza, influenza also caused 2.8 billion hit to Mexico's tourism in industry. And in general, countries where their economy relies very much on very much on tourism and travel, they will have a significant um, uh, impact uh, with outbreaks. Um, trail and retail industries, um, total global economic loss due to SARS was near $40 billion. In China, this caused a 0.8% drop in its um, uh, gross domestic product. Demand of oil dropped by 300,000 barrels a day in Asia. MERS causes 10% drop in accommodation and food sectors in South Korea. Environmental impacts, um, they are usually overlooked in economic assessments because environmental resources are non, considered non-market goods. Uh, they cannot be traded, and that's why usually they're overlooked. However, in the last 20 years, it appears that um, this has improved uh, due to the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity um, initiative, which is basically an initiative that that determines um, the uh, impact of infections and outbreaks on the environment and calls for also more investment uh, from different sectors um, to environmental to protect environmental resources. Um, the Ebola, Ebola in West Africa led to illegal poaching, logging, and mi mining, negatively impacting earlier advancements made <clears throat> in environmental protection. Other impacts uh, that are sometimes forgotten that can also influence um, the economy, psychological, educational, professional losses on the individual consumer and household. For example, six, 1,600,000 children lost parents to Ebola, leaving orphans needing long-term care, lost education, leading to exposure to child abuse, causing emotional trauma, permanent removal from education, education system, and unwanted pregnancies, and all of which will ultimately lead to lower productivity impacting the um, uh, economy. Um, and this is just a table of some, um, what I also talked about um, in 2009, 
Tourism in Mexico caused a $2.8 billion loss uh, due to H1N1. Uh, the effect of uh, Rift Valley fever in, in, on, the ag on agriculture in Somalia lost, uh, caused a loss of $435 billion, uh, sorry, million dollars. And also the list um, goes on. Travel with SARS in 2003 globally caused loss of more than $7 billion. So um, the WHO gave out a guide um, to the economic consequences of disease and injury. And it not only pertains to infectious diseases, but also on any disease and illness. It is a way for basically the WHO to give, um, um, uh, to allow different sectors to measure the um, economic consequences a disease may, might have, and therefore allows uh, the appropriate intervention that will um, ultimately lead to uh, limiting that economic uh, impact or avoiding it. Um, so according to the WHO, um, they divided the economic impact uh, at two levels. The macroeconomic level, which is the aggregate impact of a disease on a country's current or future domestic growth product, which is a measure of a country's economy. And at the microeconomic level on households, firms, or governments. Um, with the economic burden studies that they presented and they used, they ultimately identified strategies for reducing cost via appropriate prevent preventive and treatment strategies. Um, the results um, were and should be useful for policymakers to assess the overall magnitude of economic losses and their distribution and therefore allow for policymakers to make the appropriate decisions regarding investments. So at the macroeconomic um, level, um, the impact is due to losses of non-health related goods and services linked to diseases due to increased health ex expenditure, um, uh, labor and productivity losses, reduced investment in human and physical capital uh, formation. At the microeconomic level, um, the impact is due to increased household expenses on health services and goods, reduced time spent working that allows to consume market goods, reduced consumption of non-health goods and or liquidate savings and assets. People are in households are going to use, all, use up all their savings. The first mention of official work in economic impact studies was in 1951, um, collection of evidence about potential economic benefits associated with public health interventions to persuade governments to allocate investments in health. And this is basically the, uh, the goal of this guide. So this is an algorithm uh, for determining approach, which is in the, the guide. The guide is a, it's very, very big and very comprehensive. And this is all just, you know, language uh, that I'm not familiar with. Uh, but basically, it's um, you assess uh, the um, uh, what you want to, to assess. Do you want to assess the impact um, that a certain disease can have on uh, the micro economy or macro economy. And then when you make, once you make that determination, then you can um, uh, determine which model to use to actually assess that impact. Um, so that's sort of at the end. And uh, I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't um, spend a lot of time on it because it has a lot of language that I'm not familiar with, but basically this is just the outline. Um, the economic costs of endemic infectious diseases with polio, HIV, TB, and uh, malaria. So the economics of TB control. TB control has a very significant impact on the economy. TB is a leading cause of death among infectious diseases with 1.7 million deaths per year in an assessment in 2017. And TB affects the, um, an individual in their, in their working age, basically. And that is why it affects the economy um, very significantly. Country studies show that each TB patient, on average, loses three to four months of work time annually and lost earnings to 20 to 30 percent of household income. And even families of people who die from TB lose 15 years of income. Uh, according to the WHO, the global burden of TB can amount to around $12 billion annually. By contrast, a 50% reduction in TB-related deaths would cost $900 million per year. So a significant difference. Um, cost of TB control in low middle income countries, it's actually not a lot. A six month course, as little as $20 per patient. 
And that figure rises with other uh, indirect causes that can rise uh, uh, up to 100 to 200 dollars. Um, and even, however, even in these low middle, uh, low to middle income countries, um, the it is still considered a cost effective intervention uh, uh, TB control. High income settings or MDR settings such as Russia, the cost of treatment or the cost of control can exceed ten thousand uh, dollars per case. So the effect of TB on poverty, this sort of illustrates the other indirect um, costs that uh, TB can have on an individual, not only pertaining to the medications or you know, the healthcare services provided, but also what happens to an individual and to a household um, uh, with TB. So um, it basically tells you in the pre-diagnosis to the diagnosis, which is like a six month period where the patient is becoming ill and has a lot of health issues. Um, they're not being productive at work. They're taking up loans. They're getting their schools out of, children out of schools. Um, they're, uh, you know, they're using up all their assets. And this, obviously the, 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 the bars show you how, uh, like they're borrowing money, they're getting donations, et cetera. Um, and then in the, in the intensified treatment phase, this is actually more pronounced. And then as you go down to the, uh, you know, the continuation phase, it becomes a little better. People are becoming more productive. So it just illustrates that basically it's not the, the cost of TB is not only related to medications and uh, complications and so forth, but it also has a significant uh, 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 like, uh, toll on social as other social aspects of an individual's life, which will ultimately impact uh, the economy at the microeconomic level as well. Um, evidence on economic model, uh, economic impact led to rising investments in TV control and hybrid in countries led by country level resources. Economic models from South Africa showed no obvious low cost, high return options for TV control, meaning the more you invest, the higher is the impact, basically. Uh, this calls for a comprehensive package of intervention for TB control. And based on this particular article, they assess that it requires a funding of uh, an increase in funding by a factor of two to three. The impact of malaria, there is a 400 to 900 million febrile infections due to malaria, causing a 0.7 to 2.7 million deaths annually. Families spend up to 25% of income on treatment. There was a study that showed that countries with endemic malaria had income levels only 33% of countries that did not. And countries with severe malaria burden grew 1.3% less per year compared to those countries uh, without malaria. So again, also a significant impact. Economic impact of HIV AIDS. Um, the impact of HIV AIDS is very strong as far as the economy. Um, and this can be illustrated in this, um, this uh, figure here, which basically shows how HIV AIDS affects the growth domestic product through multiple pathways. So um, for example, here HIV, HIV infection causes um, the individual to reduce savings and invest less, causing a reduction in labor productivity, ultimately lowering the uh, GDP. Also reduce consumption, which will ultimately lower the GDP. GDP. Also, HIV infection or HIV individuals with HIV tend to value short term benefits more than long term benefits, and therefore they may not invest in education, which will ultimately reduce labor productivity, lowering the GDP. And children of individuals with HIV, if, they can become orphaned. You know, if they die of AIDS, they become orphaned. This means that they will also contribute less or, um, because of the contribute less to uh, productivity because they're, you know, they're not in schools anymore. Um, and for that same reason also, um, being an orphan in that setting will cause a higher dependency ratio, meaning that there's less, uh, less of the population contributes to economy, less working age population, it contributes less to the economy, causing a lower GDP. And, and you know, in that same uh, note um, for HIV and HIV individuals as well, due to premature mortality and retirement, also it causes a higher dependency ratio, which will ultimately lower uh, the GDP. 
So um, the effect of labor, labor productivity and health related quality of life, uh, there was a cross-sectional study in Zambia that compared productive days lost uh, due to illness between HIV infected and non-HIV infected uh, patients over a period of three months. And they saw that the days lost was actually one month per one day per month, which included the day that the HIV individuals collected their um, medication. Um, but this particular study did not really show that significant effect, but prior studies showed uh, a significant uh, difference. Uh, another prospective study followed 54 pa uh, patients with HIV in Kenyan tea plantations until their end of work lives. And they, the results showed that they missed as many as three years of work um, from the time that they start work till their end of work lives, which is a lot. Um, another study showed that there was a second fall in productivity earlier in the course of HIV, right before the start of ART that lasts approximately one year. Now, the effect of ART, not only on the patient's health, but also it has a, um, uh, a uh, benefit to the economy. It restores labor productivity, and it also improves health-related quality of life. There was a study that looked at the uh, perceived quality of life between patients uh, with HIV who have been on ART for more than five years and non-HIV individuals. And um, uh, they showed that there's, it showed that there was no difference in perceived quality of life. So they had good quality of life, they were productive. In that same study as a secondary outcome um, on the side, it showed that 43% of those individuals that, that had HIV were actually unaware of their status when they entered that study. And 12% were aware, but were not in care, which as a secondary outcome, it showed that there's a challenge with linkage to care and art initiation. Implications for policy de design because of the significant effect that HIV AIDS can have on the economy. This calls for a uh, uh, strong economic rationale for frequent testing and early intervention and need for individual incentives. Um, based on this article, they also looked at studies that showed what a individual with HIV, um, you know, what they do with their uh, sexual behavior or any, do they, do they continue to engage in uh, risky sexual behavior? And they showed that actually the evidence is inconsistent uh, to show that they do not engage in risky sexual behavior. And they saw, they, they said that basically not only do we need for frequent, the need for frequent testing and early intervention, but individual incentives also uh, need to be um, uh, established and counseling also, uh, they need to be included in all these um, measurements because we can't assume that individuals with HIV will not engage in risky sexual behavior. So there needs to be other ways to prevent uh, new infections and therefore ultimately increase uh, productivity. Uh, economic models support test and treat strategy for HIV individuals, and uh, there is still a challenge to this motivation to initiate ART if they don't see immediate benefit. Therefore, prevention measures are also important in policy design. Uh, the economic implications of polio eradication using the inactivated polio vaccine versus o OPV, uh, also um, they assessed the um, uh, the impact of economy or the impact of polio eradication versus uh, control on the economy. And the economic cost benefit analysis models showed a potential future cost savings of full eradication to be very high. The results of eradication prevented more than 1 million cases with net economic benefit of more than $180 billion, which did not include intangible costs of suffering, death, and fear. So transition from oral uh, polio vaccine strategies to inactivated based strategies, even in low income settings, resulted in lower cumulative costs over a 20 year period. Um, for example, also in India in 2011, 11, they were able to refocus their resources, the country's resources to other diseases. So it has a, a significant impact also on other um, other diseases. The Global uh, Polio Eradication Initiative, it was launched in 19, uh, 1988 by the WHO, CDC, United Nations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, there was a study uh, that it is an initiative basically to uh, advocate for uh, polio eradication. 
there was a study that compared uh, the economic impact with and without the initiative. And the expected net benefit with the initiative was 40 to 50 billion between 1988 to 2000, 2035, with an additional 17 to 19 billion dollars for benefits of the use of vitamin A supplements. Another study showed, assuming full eradication is achieved with continued use of IPV, the net benefit could be 16 to 17 billion dollars between two, 2013 to 2052 compared to continuous use of OPV. And this, again, the, it calls for uh, an economic case for sustained efforts for eradication. So control strategies for polio, HIV, TB are complex and distinct. Global goals and, and, and com campaigns play an important role in driving such efforts. Economic models depend on effective implementation and human behavior, and we'll talk about that as well. Testing, case detection, drugs, vaccines are all associated with significant costs, um, but there's a, a great um, uh, benefit. A decrease in funding may jeopardize uh, progress that is already made. And uh, so this was basically a forum, and it was basically given to uh, um, drive different sectors and policymakers to, um, uh, you know, to give um, uh, rationale for investing in such strategies. Um, this is just a um, something else uh, that I saw stockpiling for influenza pandemics, and it basically uh, shows that um, the Economic models suggest the benefit of stockpiling vaccines, mechanical ventilators, antiviral drugs to prepare for influenza pandemic, but um, they um, don't take into consideration human resources and manpower. Uh, so sometimes models, economic models may not um, uh, not have a, a, a full um, uh, prediction of what may happen. Um, so for example, here in the conventional uh, like the conventional capacity level and contingency capacity level and crisis capacity level, as you reach the crisis capacity level, they, you know, the, the number of patients that can be ventilated by stockpiling, you know, in, can increase. However, it doesn't take into account that there's an additional manpower that is required with respiratory therapists, physicians, critical care nurses. So it just shows that there's some challenges to economic models. So, um, this is a uh, basically a framework of uh, economic impact of infectious diseases, and um, it is the models that are used to assess and predict where outbreaks are going and how that will ultimately impact the economy. So the framework involves three sections, transmission dynamic model, uh, disease dynamic model, and economic impact model. And basically in the first part, it just tells you that um, the upper, up, upper portion, it just tells you how a pathogen can cause an infection in humans. This will ultimately lead to two responses, a biologic response and social response. The biologic response, which is the disease itself, the illness that that infection causes, will obviously affect, and by different means, it'll affect uh, 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 economy by uh, reducing productivity, consumption, ultimately affecting economy. But in addition to that, there are social responses that are associated with the infection that also need to be taken into consideration, like what's going on right now with COVID-19. And these social responses are taken at the individual level, organization level, and government level. So this takes into account what humans do during an outbreak, for example, that will ultimately impact the economy. Um, so things like, you know, social distancing and other, other um, uh, 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 regulations by, for example, the government uh, to shut down the government or to shut down enterprises and how that will ultimately impact uh, the economy. So, so I guess before in economic models, they didn't take into consideration the social responses. So, and this also outlines uh, the dynamics of human behavior and how human behavior can impact where a disease or an outbreak goes and ultimately will impact um, the economy. So it, and this tells you that human decisions uh, play a very significant role in where the, uh, what happens to the to disease prevalence. So, um, and it's, it's in a basically a loop. So disease is affected and affects human behavior. And so the infection levels drive behavior and then behavior shapes how the disease uh, spreads. And it talked about how 
human decisions are determined by what they call trade-offs, meaning that, yes, health is important to um, human beings, but so is family, so is social life, so is money, so these are all things that are not necessarily measured while they do very much impact uh, the economy. So um, that was the reason why they developed epidemiological economic, the uh, uh, economical model, which is an epidemic risk um, uh, model that incorporates human behavior and responses. It takes the susceptible infected recovered model and incorporates that with models of human responses to an outbreak. And this, these model the trade-offs that drive human to human contact decisions. It recognizes individuals response to either limiting contact or they, if they derive utility from contact with others leading to increased disease prevalence. So these economic models are not explicitly um, based on the r naught which takes into account only disease-free behavior. Ultimately, the model reveals that human responses can shape disease dynamics and have critical implications for public health policies. Better understanding of human behavior and collaboration of different disciplines is required for an optimal cost-effective disease response uh, strategy. Um, this was an article that was published, um, I think, in March of uh, this year, and it basically the authors wanted to determine uh, the potential effect of COVID-19 uh, and on the economy and what's going to happen uh, uh, 40 years out from the end of the pandemic. And it basically looked at um, the uh, 15 large pandemics since the 14th century with at least 100,000 deaths. And they looked at data from Europe, what they called aggregate Europe, and they tried to uh, predict using that data, predict what's going to happen with uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, and so they looked at two things. Um, and these are, again, um, definitions that are very like they are very related to economy, obviously. So but what I understood it to be so natural. The natural rate of interest is the interest rate that supports the economy at full employment, maximum output while keeping inflation constant, adjusted to remove the effects of inflation. It is a level of real returns on safe assets while keeping prices stable. So the way I understood it is that if the economy is suffering, there's going to be a drop in the natural rate of interest because there is less in, in, uh, incentive to, to um, invest. Um, Real wages, also this, uh, um, this article evaluated real wages as well, uh, which are wages adjusted for inflation in terms of the amount of goods and services that can be bought. So the real wages represent an individual's actual purchasing power after accounting for inflation. And the way I understood it is basically how, how much you can do with your money, um, how much, how powerful your, your money is. Um, so this is what it showed. Um, it showed that after, and this was again, this was based on all the data that they collected from all these previous pandemic pandemics, and it showed that after a pandemic is over, there's going to be a decline in the uh, natural rate of interest, and it's going to reach a nadir 20 years from the end of the pandemic, and then it's going to rise up until year 40 after the pandemic, in which it will be similar to uh, what it would have been without the pandemic. And um, this is all because of depressed investment opportunities due to excess capital per unit of surviving labor inc and an increased desire to save and the need to rebuild depleted uh, wealth. And it also looked at differences based on the country. Again, these were for previous pandemics. So, for example, there was an even uh, like a significant effect on uh, the natural rate of interest, which are all measures of macroeconomy, by the way, a significant effect on France, countries like France, Italy, uh, the Netherlands, maybe not so much for Germany and the UK. And these differences are due to uh, basically how industrialized the, the, the country was at the start of the pandemic and the size of the working population. So there were differences based on country. The effect on real wages is actually the exact opposite. Um, of uh, what would be expected on the natural rate of interest after a pandemic. Your money becomes stronger, basically, um, because of lower productivity. So, and this is illustrated here, where at the year 30 after the, the pandemic, there's going to be a peak um, uh, in, the, in real wages. 
So reduced labor will push real wages up. Basically, this is what it means. And this, and then they compared uh, what happens with war uh, versus pandemics, and they saw that it's the exact opposite. So as pandemics will drop the natural rate of interest, war tends to increase the natural rate of interest because there because war needs funding, and there's you know a large amount of money um, that is required from financing, so it raises uh, uh, interest rates up. So the overall results is that following a pandemic, there is depressed investment opportunities uh, due to excess capital per unit of surviving labor and increased desire to save as preca uh, precautionary or need to rebuild depleted wealth. This is also um, a, an article that showed the effect of COVID-19, uh, what it has been doing to the gross domestic product, which is again a, country, a measure of a country's macroeconomy, since the, basically it's the biggest hit to the economy since to the recession in 2008. And it looks at different, you know, the world and uh, d developed advanced countries and the United States in green. This is another article from the New York Times uh, last year, and it also looked at the drop in the GDP, uh, comparing that to the Great Recession. So a 4.8% drop in the GDP, and this was from since uh, from April. And also this looked at um, this this looked at um, also uh, those uh, the drops in uh, the economy related to uh, auto sales during COVID-19, business investments, uh, services. Uh, and also if you look here, there, the food at home surged as restaurants suffered. So this represents how restaurants suffered and how there's a drop and spending food at home and this correlates with how you know how uh, uh, grocery stores have been gaining a lot of uh, money because for, for this reason so um what is being done to minimize economic impact or what should be done uh by these all these sectors that are involved investing in improved sanitation provision of clean water and better urban infrastructure uh, structure building strong healthcare systems and supporting proper nutrition, investment in reliable disease surveillance, and investment in inform informal surveillance systems like ProMed and Health, uh, Health Map, which are basically, they ga gather uh, information from other official surveillance reports from media, eyew eyewitnesses, and also collaborations for monitoring epidemic readiness is required. And this is uh, via the Global Health Security Agenda and Joint External um, Evaluation Alliance. So in conclusion, infectious diseases is a major problem in the world with potential devastating effects globally. For infectious diseases, it's challenging given we cannot pre predict when or where they will emerge due to biologic, social, and political causes. The investment in the fight against infectious diseases benefits world economy and individual family economies. So it is a matter of not only public health, but also of economic interest to invest and organize an internationally coordinated strategy to fight and control infectious diseases. Public and private stakeholders at local, national, and international levels must work together systematically and encourage cost-sharing strategies for prevention and preparedness and optimal intervention, interventional strategies. And investments should seek to strengthen overall human, animal, and environmental health systems for broad societal benefits. Thank you.